Now, let us first go over the skull as a whole. So I'll show you the picture for the lateral view. We can clearly see the cranium and the facial part, but take a look at the V mandible and the TMJ since we're going to be discussing on that. And there's a video that will show an animation here is the skull in the front of you so highlighted here are the orbits but the orbits are going to be discussed for uh, in another topic the nasal bone the maxilla and the mandible and here the basal view we can clearly see the foramen magnum and all the foramens Now for the purpose of discussion, let us first divide the skull into two parts. So there's the cranial part and there's the facial part. So the skull is composed of several bones connected by immobile joints or we can call this sutures. So once again, it's really easy to understand or to study the skull if we divide it into two parts. So the cranial skeleton and the facial skeleton the cranium or the cranial skeleton is formed by th the superior aspect of the skull it encloses and protects the brain meninges and cerebral vasculature so simply it encloses the brain so it is there to protect the brain from trauma or from any force that will damage it the skull vault or the calvarium is the upper part of the cranium and forms the roof and side walls of the cranial cavity. The base of the skull is the lowest part of the cranium and forms the floor of the cranial cavity. So we'll focus first on the cranium, then after that we'll discuss uh, on the, the facial bones. So the cranium again is the one that holds the brain. So we have a cranial cavity, a cranial vault, and the cranial floor or the, the skull base. So for the cranium, it is composed of eight bones, simply the frontal bone, we have two parietal bones colored in blue, we have an occipital bone, occipital bone colored in green, the temporal bones, the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid bone. So all of these are joined together by sutures. So again, sutures are immovable joints, and this is a an example of the skull of a child wherein sutures and some of the bones haven't fused already. So we have the anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle that are opened at birth, then it will just close by endochondral ossification here so for the posterior fontanelle it closes around 12 months but i've read i've read on some other sources that it closes around 6 to 12 months now for the anterior fontanelle it closes late at 18 months so these fontanelles are, you can really appreciate these structures when you have a newborn coming at the ER or let's say around three month old baby coming at the ER, the mother complained of LBM, uh, could be what they call this, uh, food poisoning, could be amoebiasis, and uh, when you assess the fontanelle of the child, you can clearly see that the child is dehydrated when it's depressed. So you must rehydrate at the proper rate to restore the hydration of the child or else you will go into severe, de severe dehydration wherein it's already, uh, what do you call this? Um, 
here we can see a skull of an infant around probably around four to six months and we can clearly appreciate the the lines or the sutures the joints and there are four of them so we have the coronal suture the sagittal suture the lambdoid suture and the frontal suture so these sutures are immovable joints and we can clearly see the the part wherein bone hasn't ossified yet so the anterior fontanel and the posterior fontanel so in infants uh, this hasn't been um, closed yet so you can clearly appreciate this if you have a baby at home if a baby is also dehydrated this will also be depressed so you can use this as your physical exam tool when examining an infant if it is dehydrated or not so now now go on to the discussion of the individual cranial bone so the first bone that we are going to tackle is the frontal bone so it's the one colored in blue it's the forehead bone you can clearly touch it it makes the upper margins of the orbit as we all know the orbit is comprised of many bones of the skull and the upper margins are from the frontal bone you can also see the supercellular arches and the supra orbital notch so medially the frontal bone articulates with the frontal processes of the maxilla and the nasal bones mm -hmm. laterally the frontal bone articulates with the zygomatic bone and one highlight of the frontal bone is that it contains two hollow spaces lined with mucous membrane the frontal air sinuses just above the orbital margins these sinuses communicate with the nose and serve to lighten the facial skeleton and act as voice resonators so sometimes when you massage this area you can feel relieved and when it's clogged up due to sinusitis so it's really difficult so the next bone that we're going to discuss is the parietal bone so the one colored in green so the parietal bones are paired bones and the two bones are separated by the sagittal suture so the parietal bones form the sides and roof of the cranium and articulate with each other in the midline at the sagittal suture they also articulate with the occipital bone through the lambdoid suture now we move on to the occipital bone this is the bone at the back of your head and it's cupped like a saucer in order to house the back of the brain and it also contains the foramen magnum. The parietal bones articulate to the squamous part of the occipital bone at the lambdoid suture. The occipital bone also articulates with the temporal bone on each side. A roughened elevation, the external occipital protuberance which you can see here pointed at the arrow, lies in the medial the midline of the occipital bone and it gives attachment to muscles and the ligamentum nuque. So here some of the structures of the nuchal bone gives rise to attachment of muscles and to give support to the head. The next bone that we are going to tackle is the temporal bone. We have this is a paired bone. We have a left and a right temporal bone. This is a bit important bone since it has many functions so to go or to have an overview of these functions we need to discuss first the parts of the temporal bone we have the squamous part this one here the zygomatic process this one here the tympanic part the styloid part and the petromastoid part so it has an accommodation for the for for auditory functions and it also has accommodation or attachments for muscles of mastication
The next bone, the sphenoid bone, is an unpaired bone and it consists of a body, a paired greater wings, and a lesser wings, and two pterygoid processes. It is a hollow bone separated by a septum, and highlights of this bone is that it forms part of the orbit, and um, it has the cella torsica, a saddle-shaped depression that uh, has the pit or accommodates the pituitary gland, and it also has the chiasmic a chiasmatic groove, a sulcus formed by the optic chiasm. Last but not the least, the ethmoid bone. So it separates the nasal cavity from the brain and it's the roof of the nose. It also contributes, also forms part of the orbit and it forms the medial wall. The olfactory nerve or the cranial nerve 1 has a close anatomical relationship with the ethmoid bone as its numerous nerve fibers pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, as you can see here on the picture. We discussed the natin yung 8 cranial bones and these bones fuse together to form a cavity. So, this cavity holds the brain and is also known as the cranial cavity. It contains the brain and its surrounding meninges, portions of the cranial nerves, arteries, veins, and venous sinuses. The cranial vault is the space in the skull that houses the neurocranium. And this is the roof of the cranial bone, as you can see, formed mostly by the frontal bone, the parietal bones, and the occipital bone and part of the temporal bone and you can see grooves for the arteries and you can see the sutures but the most interesting part is the base of the skull and we will divide discussion on this base into three parts first is the anterior cranial fossa the middle cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa so what can we see on the anterior cranial fossa to so the next part of the base of the skull is the middle cranial fossa it is located, as its name suggests, centrally on the cranial floor. It is said to be butterfly-shaped, with the middle part accommodating the pituitary gland and two lateral parts accommodating the temporal lobes of the brain. Now, for the last part of the floor of the skull, or the cranial floor, is the posterior cranial fossa, which houses the brainstem and the cerebellum. As you can see, there is a big hole the foramen magnum, and all of this fossa contains several foramens.